this video, I will be discussing transition metals and their chemistry, which is topic 17 in Ideal Adexcel Chemistry, the syllabus. And this is actually quite a big topic, so I'm going to be breaking up uh, this topic into some parts, okay? And this is going to be part one, where I uh, discuss the general things about transition metals. So, let's start off by defining transition elements. So this is actually a d-block element that forms one or more stable ions that have incomplete d orbitals, okay? So, which means that we need to kind of exclude scandium and zinc because scandium only forms uh, scandium 3 plus with the electronic structure of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 2p6, 3p6, 3d0. So the d orbital over here is completely empty, right? So it's not an incomplete d orbital. Um, so, and it only forms this oxidation stage, right? So this cannot be a transition metal, okay? And for zinc, it only forms uh, Zn2+, plus with the electronic structure of the same thing, and then 3d10, which is a full d orbital. So it's not an incomplete d orbital either. So therefore, these two cannot be transition elements, okay? So let's see, let's see some of the examples of the variable oxidation states. So for over here, we have the iron and manganese, which are in the d-block elements, um, uh, which are in the d-block in the periodic table. Uh, we have Fe2+, plus, iron 2+, plus ion, Fe3+, plus, iron 3+, plus ion, um, and we have some of the manganese, uh, manganese 2 plus ion and manganese oxides and manganate ions. So um, the oxidation states for these guys, if you work these out, um, it's going to be 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus, 6 plus, and 7 plus. So for example, I'll just work one out for a manganate, manganate ion. So over here we have four oxygen ions. So oxygen counts for minus two, and there are four of them that so that it adds up to minus eight, right? But the overall charge of the uh, whole ion is one negative, negative one, so minus one. So we know that manganese has to give a seven plus charge so that it gives, you know, um, plus seven minus eight equals minus one, right? So that's how you work out the oxidation states. So as you can see, we have the variable oxidation states. Um, so how do they have variable oxidation states, right? So over here, I have an energy diagram where we have the different shells and different subshells. So I have 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 3d, and 4s and 4p, okay? Increasing in energy levels. Um, so in the electrons inside the 4s and 3d orbitals actually have similar energies, right? The y axis is some energy, so um, their energy levels is very, very similar. But in fact, 4s is obviously um, very, very slightly lower than 3d. Um, so that means that the stabilities of different ions are going to be similar, where they have uh, ions basically electrons in the 3d orbitals, um, however many electrons they have in the 4s or in 3d, okay? Uh, by the way, this diagram is not to scale, just to note. Um, so we're going to look at the uh, concept of complex ions that transition elements form. So uh, what it is, is a central metal ion that is positive, surrounded by one or more covalently bonded ligands, okay? So in this particular example, we have hexa aqua copper. So let's look into that name first of all. So hexa stands for six, um, aqua stands for water, and copper stands for the central metal ion over here, Cu2+, okay? So we can see that there are six water ligands surrounding the central metal ion, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. So that is hexa aqua and the central metal ion is copper two plus, so co uh, copper, and then the oxidation state of copper. So the chemical formula for this complex ion would be um, square brackets, first of all, because it's a complex ion. So we have Cu and then um, water bonded to Cu dative by dative covalent bonding, and we have the two plus charge, the overall charge, okay? Um, that's the overall charge because Cu has two plus and water doesn't count for any charges, right? So yeah, let's 
Um, yeah, that's essential metal ion. And so let's look at the definition of ligands. So a ligand is a molecule or a negative ion with a lone pair of electrons that can be donated to form dative covalent bonds with metal ions, okay? So it's dative covalent bonding because they're going to donate lone pairs. Um, so we're going to look at the different types of ligands. We have monodendate ligands, bidentate ligands, and hexadentate ligands. So what do they mean? So first of all, we have the monodendate ligands. We have some examples over here. We have hydroxide ions, water, water, ammonia, and chloride ions. These are called mono because they can form one dative covalent bond per molecule, okay? So that is why they're called monodendate ligands. Now the bidentate ligands, they can form two dative covalent bonds per molecule. As you can see for this example, this is N, it's shortened as N, and its full name is going to be 1,2-diaminoethane. So we have the two amine groups on either end, and they can both donate lone pairs to form a dative covalent bond with a central metal ion. And hence, this is a bidentate ligand. Okay, and we have the hexadentate ligand. Uh, for an example, we have EDTA, 4 minus, it has a charge of 4 minus. Um, you can probably guess by now, uh, they can form six dative covalent bonds per one molecule of this ligand, okay? So the full name of ETA is ethylene diamine tetraacetate, which you don't have to know, and you don't have to know the structure, but if you're curious how this makes six dative covalent bonds around a metal ion, it kind of looks like this. So as you can see, we have the acetate groups, four acetate groups, and we have the two tertiary amine groups, all donating their lone pairs to form a dative covalent bond towards the um, central metal ion, okay? So that is how a eta molecule surrounding a metal ion looks like, but you don't have to know the structure. Um, so yeah, as, you can, as I told you, they bond by dative covalent bonding, and so around the copper 2 plus ion, there are six bond pairs repelling from each other, right? Um, and they're going to be at a position where, the mini where they experience minimum repulsion and there is maximum separation from each other. So that's going to result in a shape of an octahedral and um, the bond angles is going to be 90 degrees, okay? So um, this basically looks like SF6 from the shapes of molecules video um, and that was covered in topic three, okay? Uh, you can also watch that video if you or, or if you're curious to how we describe shapes of molecules, okay? Which is also required for this chapter, by the way. Um, so we're going to look at the coordination numbers. So then that is the number of dative covalent bonds in a complex ion, okay? So because there are six dative covalent bonds in this complex, it has a coordination number of six. Okay, so let's look at some other examples of complex ions now. Um, this is a tetrachlorochromate. So we have the four chloride ions surrounding one Cr3 plus ion. Um, because there are four bonds uh, are surrounding this central metal ion, it's going to be tetrahedral with a um, 109.5 bond angle, degree bond angle. Uh, so we have this as our molecular, not molecular formula. This is the um, chemical formula for tetrachlorochromate. We have CrCl4. And notice that over here, we have a negative sign um, because for chromium, its oxidation state is three, as you can see from the name, right? Three plus. But we have four chloride ions, which um, have a negative charge uh, per ion, right? So we have four minus and three plus, hence the overall is going to be just one minus, okay? Um, chloride ions, chloride based, the ligands, chloride ions, are relatively large with many electrons around the uh, um, nucleus. So four of them surround the metal ion, giving a tetrahedral shape with a coordination number of four instead of six, okay? Um, so
So this is another example using N. Uh, you can draw it like this, or you can also change that bit into a skeletal formula, meaning that you don't have to write CH2, 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 CH2. Um, so we have four bond pairs over, I mean, not four bond pairs, six bond pairs over here, as you can see. So the coordination number is six. And so the bonds are going to go to a position where they uh, experience minimum repulsion and they're at maximum separation distance um, so they're going to give an octahedral shape with a bond angle of 90 degrees and this is how you write the chemical formula so we have nickel and before we write the charge because the charge has to be inside outside the square bracket because this is the whole ion um, and n3 because we have one two three um, uh, ligands okay n ligands and this is another example, this is dichlorodiamino platinum. So this actually has some isomers. Um, this one in particular is a cis platin, which has anti-cancer properties and therefore uh, used, in anti -cancer, used as an anti-cancer drug, okay? But uh, this is, by the way, uh, called cis platin because the chloride ions, as you can see, is on the same side. The ammonia ion, uh, ammonia molecules are on the same side as well. Uh, by the way, this is a planar molecule with a 90 degree bond angle, okay? So it means that it's just on a flat surface, okay? Um, as you can see from the chemical formula, we have two molecules of ammonia and two molecules of chlorine. So only this isomer is going to be used as our anti-cancer drug, uh, meaning that this molecule, which is the transplatin, uh, because the ammonia is now across each other, the chloride ions are across each other, so um, the transplatin is not going to be used because this one doesn't have anti-cancer properties, okay, as opposed to cisplatin, okay? So the structures, they really do ma matter. Um, now we're going to look at the hemoglobin molecule. So over here I have two different colors of polypeptide chains, basically proteins, um, of alpha chains and beta chains. We have two beta and two alpha chains. And these pink groups are heme groups, okay? So we're going to look more into heme groups. Um, just to add, by the way, this hemoglobin molecules are basically hands of red blood cells. So they grab onto oxygen. Um, while being carried in the red blood cell, so um, they can deliver oxygen to our tissues, okay? And so this diagram is actually very simplified, okay? It actually looks more like um, this. So as you can see, we have the alpha and beta chains, the two different chains, um, and we have the, if you can see over here, that is the green bit, that is the heme group that the polypeptide chains um, have. So uh, yeah, that's the heme group. We're gonna focus on the heme group. So um, basically, it's a complex ion. The heme group is a complex ion uh, where the iron ion is surrounded by um, six data covalent bonds. So four is from a perforin ring, which forms four data covalent bonds onto the iron, and it forms a data covalent Data covalent bond with a globin, with the globin, basically the polypeptide chain. Um, so this is the anchor to the protein over here, and the other data covalent bond comes from the oxygen molecule. Okay, because oxygen has lone pairs, so it can form a data covalent bond. Um, so, but when a carbon monoxide molecule comes along, ligand exchange is going to occur because hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide than oxygen. So carbon monoxide is forming a stronger dative covalent bond than the dative covalent bond the oxygen forms. So when carbon monoxide attaches to the heme group, it's going to disturb the oxygen delivery in the body. So let's see um, into detail why that occurs. So usually, um, we have a reversible reaction where hemoglobin binds with four oxygens because hemoglobin has four heme groups in one molecule, um, forming, for, uh, forming oxyhemoglobin, okay? Um, so the forwards reaction occurs in the lungs where we pick up oxygen, and the backward reaction occurs in the respiring tissues where respiring, because respiring tissues need oxygen, okay? So yeah, this is what usually occurs. But when carbon monoxide binds, 
um, it's going to form carboxyhemoglobin. And the reverse reaction where it's, um, where it's detaching from carbon monoxide, um, it's not going to occur due to the strong dative covalent bond that they formed. So the hemoglobin is not going to be available to pick up oxygen and deliver oxygen to the respiring tissues. And that is why carb carbon monoxide is so toxic for us, okay? So um, next we're going to discuss why transition metals form colored aqueous solutions, okay? Um, first of all, it's because they form complex ions. But why do they form uh, colors if they form complex ions? So basically, when ligands bind, the 3D orbitals are going to split into two energy levels. So a higher energy level and a lower energy level. So for octahedral complexes, we have two orbitals going up, three go orbitals going down. Um, not down, but basically lower and higher energy levels. And tetrahedral complexes split like this, three on top, two on the bottom. Okay, um, so let's see for an example, an octahedral complex with the central metal ion being um, having nine electrons in the 3D orbital. So we have it split and you can see the electrons being filled like this. And obviously the electron is going to favor be staying in the lower energy level, right? So that's why over here we have an empty, um, I mean half empty shell. Whoops. Um, so, whoops. So yeah, um, when we shine light to the uh, aqueous solution of this complex ion, basically this light of a specific wavelength um, corresponding to the energy gap of the higher and lower split d orbitals, basically, um, it's going to excite one electron in the lower energy level and promote that electron to the higher energy level, like that. So the electron has jumped from a lower to a higher energy level, right? So in summary, uh, electrons are going to be jumping from a lower energy level to a higher energy level, okay? Um, by the absorption of light with a wavelength within the visible spectrum, this is quite important, um, visible spectrum, that co corresponds to the energy gap, okay? So therefore, the complementary color of light within the wavelength, um, with the wavelength that is not being absorbed is seen. So complementary color is seen, okay? Um, so if you have to kind of explain why it doesn't form a colored solution, you, there, there could be different um, appropriate explana explanations. For example, there could be um, a completely filled or empty 3D orbital, which means that with ligands binding, um, the 3D orbital is just not going to split into higher and lower energy levels. Therefore, there is not going to be any electron transfers, right, from higher to low. Um, and so there will be no light absorption, first of all. So there is not going to be anything called complementary color is being shown. Um, also, there could be an explanation with the fact that the energy level, so they split, but the wavelength of energy and the wavelength, wavelength of light being absorbed um, corresponding to that energy gap is not within the visible spectrum. So it could be um, absorbing UV light or infrared light, meaning that it's just not going to um, give a complementary color that our eyes can detect, okay? So yeah, those are explanations where you could um, say for a question asking you, why does this not form a color solution, okay? So, but this is um, how a transition metal forms aqueous, uh, colored aqueous solutions. Okay, so I will be discussing more about colors and color changes of transition metal ions um, in the next video. So I'll see you in part two.